Oh, awesome. Yeah, sorry, just trying to make sure that uh, everything is in order. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, as uh, you greatly introduced, my name is Ida. I'm the CEO and founder of Rapid API. Um, I'm going to give this brief conversation today about uh, different types of APIs and formats of APIs, uh, and then understanding how, how they are similar, how they differ, um, and what's the right approach for choosing the right one. Uh, in terms of trying to build an overall framework for how to manage uh, the architecture where you actually end up having multiple of these API types. Um, and just to give uh, some brief background about the company that I'm part of, uh, so we're Rapid API. We're actually the world's largest API marketplace, so serving uh, well over a million developers around the world, helping them discover and connect to over 10,000 APIs. Uh, and then on top of that, we also power, and I'll uh, speak a bit to that uh, towards the end of the, uh, of the talk today, uh, we power a lot of internal API stores uh, for larger companies that realize they have a lot of different APIs um, and a lot of different types of APIs laying around in their cloud and on-premise systems and helping them uh, and their developers make, make sense of those different APIs. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we're going to start today by talking about the proliferation and growth of APIs, uh, talk about where we normally see APIs in enterprises and the different types and how they compare, and then introduce a methodology about uh, the right approach, at least that we've seen, to organize these APIs and create a platform uh, for aiding in their discovery. So just to start off, I wanted to recapture, and I'm sure given that we're in a conference about APIs, uh, everybody here is well aware of some of these metrics, but wanted to just quickly recapture the way that the APIs have proliferated over the past few years. Uh, we've seen it uh, over the past 10 to 15 years with multiple billion dollar companies created around developing and serving these APIs uh, as products to developers. But on top of that, we've also seen a pretty large growth in the number of APIs found in uh, larger organizations that we have conducted earlier in the year, and where we measure the number of APIs that we see in different companies based on their, uh, the sizes of those organizations. Uh, and what you see is clearly as organization scales, the number of APIs and services and microservices um, that they have scale, and we've seen these similar numbers across other surveys. This is actually some numbers from Imperva from 2018. You see similar distribution in terms of the scale and the number of APIs that companies are building. Um, so the factor to acknowledge is that developers are increasingly utilizing and building APIs in order to develop their applications. In terms of 50% of the organizations, we're speaking about 300 or more APIs uh, that exist throughout the architecture. And in fact, uh, many, and, and we've worked with several of these, have thousands and thousands of APIs within their architecture. Um, and these are not just internal APIs, and this is something that I'll explain in a second. We're actually seeing those APIs oftentimes starting as internal services and microservices, but also then graduating to being partner-facing APIs and even public developer-facing APIs. So when we talk about APIs, we normally think about um, three kind of high-level schemes. So you think about the internal APIs, so these are the microservices services that are used to develop internal applications uh, and only consumed by internal developers. You have the partner APIs, so exposed ad hoc to customers or to partners that you have a direct relationship with, and then public APIs. Um, and we see that as a continuous process, and I'm, I'm going to get to the types of APIs in a second, but just wanted to recapture that uh, because that does influence in thinking about APIs that are potentially going to graduate from being purely internal to then also being publicly facing should also influence the types of APIs that are being selected. So seeing this tremendous growth in the API space, uh, we don't, one of the things that we've been observing is not just the, um, the growth in the sheer number of APIs and services, but also the growth in the variety and versatility of those API types. So going into the different types of APIs, this is actually some data from the SIN uh, survey that we've conducted earlier in the year. Um, and it includes some other technologies, so not just strictly speaking API formats. But the reality that we've seen is it's not most companies don't just have one or two or three uh, different types of APIs they're leveraging, but are actually leveraging APIs across the board. So if you think about RESTful and SOAP-based APIs, which are probably, um, as you can kind of see in the number here, in the numbers here, the most predominant types of APIs, but we're now seeing more a lot of reverse APIs, so webhooks. Um, pub sub models, GraphQL based APIs, gRPC and RPC based uh, systems. So a lot of different types of APIs um, throughout the, the, the business architecture. And the goal that we have uh, in, the quote, in, in, in this talk today is just to make a bit of sense about all these different types. So, you know, one of the natural things that we've uh, gone and done 
as we started observing this landscape, is just trying to organize those different APIs on a maturity scale. Uh, so going with the normal suspects or REST, uh, RESTful, REST-based APIs, which is probably the kind of de facto standards for what APIs should look like, at least where these have been for the past uh, few years. You also obviously have SOAP, which is uh, still predominantly found like the second most popular type of API that we see in production systems within the enterprise. Then you have the more, like the newer and more um, exotic types of APIs. So you think about GraphQL, uh, Kafka, and generally speaking, Q and asynchronous APIs. Uh, the concept of using webhooks, PubSub um, APIs, RPC, and uh, obviously the new regulation gRPC. So trying to just look at these APIs um, on more of a maturity or a timeline. And I think that a lot of people, at least that we've been engaging with, have this notion of it's, there's always going to be a best practice or a single type of API. Um, and over time, those are just going to shift. And we've seen some of that, like some types get replaced or um, shift shifted into newer, newer types, newer formats. But at the same time, we've also seen that as more of these types are being introduced, the more diversity you end up seeing uh, within enterprise architecture. And the reality of, of what's driving that is that APIs and microservices play a lot of different roles in applications. So sometimes you use an API to retrieve data, sometimes you use it to retrieve and edit and impact the data. Sometimes it's more around executing different jobs or tasks or encoding data, sending emails, processing payment, and or even converting between different uh, formats of data. So there are a lot of different roles that APIs play. And because of that, there are a lot of different requirements for these APIs. So sometimes you know that it's an API that's going to be used to explore um, and slice and dice data differently. So you want to give flexibility around that. Um, but so other times you may care about low, low latency because you're expecting requests to respond very quickly or because you're requesting a, uh, or expecting a huge volume of requests. So you want to make sure that there's no overhead. Sometimes you want to manage load uh, because you know that there are a lot of big tasks that are being executed. So the reality is because of the very nature of APIs, there isn't necessarily a one size fits all. And the newer approach that uh, we've seen is most companies actually maintaining technologies that they're acknowledging that they're going to have many different types of APIs. So this is the approach that we operate under. And then what I'd like to do is just introduce some of the most common types of APIs that we've been seeing. Um, and the use cases that um, call for, for, for leveraging those types of APIs. So the first type that I'm going to introduce, um, it's probably the de facto API type that, that people think about when they think about APIs, uh, and that's a uh, REST-based API. Uh, so those are very common uh, and have a very clean model around editing and performing crowd operation over data and treating it as object. I think that the biggest benefit, at least that I've seen with REST-based APIs, is how familiar um, developers are with them. And we've almost seen them using interchangeably for the term HTTP just because how common this paradigm for designing APIs are. And many of the public APIs that we've seen actually rely on the REST full diagram or at least something that is similar to it. Um, the base of it is very simple, operating around uh, performing operations and objects. So you can put an object, you can get it, you can delete it. Um, you can post to it and, and, and edit its data. Um, so what it gives is a very common, when, when you think about the context of editing um, and fetching data, so if you're editing and fetching tweets on Twitter API, or editing or fetching orders and ordering an e-commerce API, it gives a very simplified um, and easy to understand paradigm around working with it. And then one of the other benefits that we've seen with it is you can work with JSON, XML, plain text, so it supports a lot of different data types. Um, and again, that's one of the things that have contributed to making it very popular. Now, another type that we've seen is this again, the second most popular types of API, uh, type of API is this is so based API. So uh, simple logic protocol um, relies purely on XML uh, to make requests and again provides a very uh, set schema for editing, uh, retrieving and editing data. Uh, through that API, usually it's XML envelopes. Um, we've seen this as more as a bit of a legacy platform, almost so popular amongst a lot of uh, older or more mature APIs, uh, but still very predominant through a lot of enterprise uh, API or, or service uh, landscape. So I think that a lot of time, um, you know, we see an argument between REST uh, and SOAP and which format should be chosen. 
Um, I think that in today's day and age, um, and, and I'm kind of presenting it here together because I also think that in terms of functions speaking, they're probably of the same like classic default de facto flavor of APIs you're going to see. Uh, I think that in today's day and age, REST is probably going to end up being the most predominant and the most frequently chosen type. Uh, but those are like the two basic uh, flavors of APIs um, to be familiar with. Now, from here, I'm going to venture into a bit of the newer or, or more unique types that we're seeing. Uh, so the first one that I'm going to talk about is GraphQL. Um, the reason for it is I think that it's becoming, uh, and we're seeing it becoming tremendously popular within a lot of architectures. We're actually using it ourselves in Rapid API. Uh, so when you actually go to rapidapi.com, the entire platform is based on a GraphQL API. Um, so we have a lot of experience with it. And what's really unique about GraphQL is the ability to query pretty complex data, uh, data um, models with very simple and singular queries. So the goal is if you think about a REST or a SOAP-based API, you normally go and fetch a single piece of data at a time. And every time you fetch it, you get the entire piece of data, even if you only need parts of it. The way that GraphQL works is it gives you different data types, and you can basically build a query that fetches data from that entire um, data tree or data graph uh, that you're accessing. So for instance, if you get data about a company, you can then also get its founders and its investor and basically build out the whole graph. So the nice thing is you don't need to make multiple requests. You can make one and get all the data that you need, uh, but you also can only select the parts of the data. So if you get the data about a company, maybe you want its name, its address, and uh, country that it, uh, countries that it operates in, but you don't actually need a bunch of other data about when it was founded and the history of the company. So you can select which parts of the data you need and which types you omit. So I think that the, the use cases that we've seen is popular for GraphQL are, you know, obviously, it's, or, or the reasons that we've seen people going to use it is easy, it's pretty easy to use and a very easy transition from using RESTful and other HTTP-based APIs. Um, it can actually increase performance when querying complex data types, uh, just by building those complex queries and needing uh, data that you don't, don't need in a request. Um, it actually introduces a lot of development efficiencies by decoupling the front end and the back end of the application. So you don't actually have to worry about a lot of things like versioning or editing or removing data because the front end defines what it needs and the back end defines what it offers, and it doesn't have to be a full one-to-one -one match. And another thing that I've really liked about it is it makes it very easy to onboard new developers into using it. And the reason is by the way you build GraphQL schemas and, and types are an embedded part of it. Um, so it means that you're basically documenting the APIs as you build them. So it lends itself to really nice and easy to learn uh, APIs. So that's GraphQL. And then the last type that I'm going to really try to spotlight on um, is the idea of Kafka based APIs. And I'm going to talk specifically about that technology. Um, but I want to also emphasize that it extends itself to the broader paradigm of the synchronous APIs or queue based APIs. And the concept there is basically using a queue of operation um, to move requests or to move uh, operations from one service to another. Uh, so you can create tasks or jobs, um, put them into a queue, and allow others to consume them. So if you think about a very simple use case of that, you'd maybe have a web client for a video sharing service. So from the web client, somebody would upload a video, but then you need to encode that video. So it would push a request or an operation uh, to encode that video into a queue. And then on its own time, a separate encoding service can pull that request and process it. Now, at the same time that it's processing it, the client can keep pushing more requests. And this is one of the beautiful things about this format. And they sit in the queue, so you don't have to worry about the demand being met between all the different services at the same time. You can kind of scale them independently. And then similarly, the encoding service can finish, push another message to the queue, and the web client can use it at its own time to kind of update the UI or something. So the main use cases for using those type of asynchronous APIs are when you have a lot of processing that can happen asynchronously, uh, and you want to um, make sure that some services can scale up and down, but you don't necessarily need to account for uh, spikes in traffic um, all across the platform. Um, so again, it really easy scaling. And in general, when a big data processing or big data jobs um, are encountered. Now, a few other types of APIs that I touched on earlier uh, that we've seen as popular, the concept of webhooks, and again, this is not necessarily a type of APIs because those webhooks can be so pressed or other types um, of endpoints, but basically that you're incoming APIs when 
it's not just the developer calling the API, but also the API calling the, the developer or the, or the client back. Um, so it allows for more of those real-time events and, and, and triggering different applications. Uh, another one that we've seen that offers a different solution to some of the similar problems is the idea of sub, of sub uh, so sockets or other types of communications where messages can be sent both ways. Um, and in general, a big world around RPC, gRPC, and other uh, ways, and, and other flavors. Um, so the idea of remote uh, process calling um, and being able to trigger um, processes uh, or procedures in our machine through those uh, APIs. And we have seen gRPC, especially where low latency um, and low overhead is required, starting to gain a lot of traffic and uh, popularity within our um, customer base. So what did I summarize that? And again, pull out the fact that one of the things that we've been seeing is beyond just the need uh, to choose the right, it's not really about choosing the right type of API, and in that, can, in, in that sense, the topic of this conversation may be a little misguided. It's about acknowledging that every API may end up having a different type. Um, and more and more, we see organizations and architectures facing a more heterogeneous environment. So if you think about it, even from an infrastructure perspective, you have some APIs and services that are running on-premise, some APIs and services that are running in the cloud, and then also consuming a bunch of APIs that are third parties. And then those APIs, again, in those kind of free general areas, end up having a bunch of different flavors and types. Um, and some of the architectural decisions um, and the DevOps decisions around it need to account um, for that um, variety in types of services and the uh, number of services that are being used. And this is where we see the need to basically establish a hub or a catalog where all of these APIs can go and live regardless of the types uh, of, of the types um, and flavor of the APIs and regardless of the infrastructure and where they're actually running. So I'm going to talk for a second about, uh, and I know that I uh, only have a couple of minutes left for this conversation, but I'm going to quickly introduce the idea of that API hub or API platform uh, that we see growing within enterprise architecture. Um, and again, this is acknowledging the fact that uh, a lot of companies are going towards microservices. I sh I've shown some of the numbers earlier around the number of APIs uh, that we see within enterprises. Um, and those APIs are becoming increasingly important. I'm just skipping ahead here a little bit. Um, to unlocking innovation and easing development within the organization. So what we've seen companies doing is, again, acknowledging they're going to have hundreds of APIs spread across the cloud, some on-premise systems, um, and then third-party APIs that they're consuming with many different flavors, creating that centralized platform or that centralized hub that developers from the one hand can publish and share APIs using, using it, and from the other hand, that engineering teams can refer to to discover and consume those APIs. So we think about it as that central enterprise hub uh, or enterprise API platform, where the API creators, again, can go to publish the APIs, the internal developers use that platform to discover and connect to those APIs within your organization, while at the same time, the external, external developers, so either partners, customers, clients, uh, can also be invited to that platform and gain access to certain APIs. Um, and the governance team can refer to that enterprise platform to discover and, or to discover and understand who's using APIs with the organization and how they're being uh, consumed. Um, so from a publishing perspective, you know, some of the core capabilities that we're seeing is just think about things like, sorry, not sure what I'm doing wrong here, but uh, publishing API document, being able to publish API documentation and reading with the CXCB um, is process as well as the gateway of these APIs um, to be able to connect all the way through to the runtime with them, being able to access um, or to control the access and visibility of these APIs so when publishing an API into the hub, who can control it and uh, how they can do so. Um, being able to support, and again, this very much relates to this conversation, all the different types of APIs, um, acknowledging that the enterprise is going to have multiple flavors, uh, and being able to easily monetize those APIs, especially as they start getting exposed to external partners. But more of the discovery and consumption piece, um, I think that the most critical or the basic functionality is just powering API search um, and allowing developers to easily search and discover those APIs. And from there, uh, and again, tagging and filtering to support that, allowing developers to easily uh, test and experience those APIs, generate code snippets to integrate them, um, and then monitor and analyze these um, APIs easily. So again, kind of 
zooming out here, um, we see this as becoming a very critical platform for both people creating and maintaining microservices in the organization um, and consuming them to be able to collaborate in APIs. And then just to very quickly touch in the last kind of like 90 seconds of this talk about Rapid API and what we do. So we are that platform, that API hub or API catalog within the organization uh, that connects the API producers and the API consumers. So powering the API economy by allowing developers to easily discover all the different APIs within the organization, uh, easily connect to them um, and integrate them into the applications, and then be able to monitor and analyze the APIs too. And one of the things that we've emphasized here at Rapid is being able to, or being built for that next generation of APIs where there are a lot of different flavors and types of APIs within the architecture. So think about REST, so Kafka, string-based APIs, uh, synchronous APIs, and so forth. And supporting all of them as first-class citizens on the platform. So if you think about you know, the way REST and SOAP APIs are supported and get this native look and feel in the platform. So replicating that also with GraphQL APIs and giving them a first-class citizen a very native feel within the platform. Um, and then even things like Kafka kind of other exotic types of APIs. Um, so this, this is where the Rapid API platform fits into that. Um, and I know that this has been a very brief kind of introduction uh, to it, but I also just wanted to call out that if after this conversation, you have any questions about the platform or in general, any thoughts or conversation or questions around the different flavors of APIs and how they fit into your architecture, uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, we're always happy to talk about that. And then my personal contact is Edo, so IDO at rapidapi.com, and feel free to send me a message or inquiries about that at any time.